a new chapter in Hebrews. Last chapter in Hebrews. I was looking at my preaching calendar and I was trying to figure out when we started and it was, well, it was last year, but we've been going through Hebrews for a little over a year now. And so we have today and next week we should finish up Hebrews. So I'm excited for that. I, it's always fun to start a project, but it's even funner to finish, you know, so, so that's good. It's interesting for us, though, as we move in from chapter 12 and we move into chapter 13, we see here an abruptness. We see there's a significant difference in, uh, of the author's um, content in many respects. Um, for so much of the book, we have looked at uh, the book of Hebrews, and so through so much of the, uh, the theme has been this, Jesus is greater than. Jesus is greater than. We've seen it over and over again. And not only that, the practical implication of the fact that Jesus is greater than is that it would be crazy to go ahead and to jump away from Jesus or to leave Jesus. If Jesus is greater than, then stay on the raft, stay on the boat, do not, do not abandon him. So we've seen this over and over and over again, and we've seen this essentially for 12 chapters. Now as we come into the 13th chapter, all of a sudden we get some we get some, I guess, what you'd call sort of pastoral exhortations towards moral things and how to live your life. But it is, is so dramatic that some people say, well, perhaps this is sort of, you know, was tacked on. But I don't think that's the case either. I think what we have here is we have a practical application of the first 12 chapters in many respects. If you go to the 12th chapter, and let's pick it up in verse 28. So I'll have you turn there this morning. So Hebrews chapter 12, 28. And what we're going to do is we're going to take 1228, and we're going to use that, and we're going to use that as a bridge into the 13th chapter, and I think that makes things all smooth out. So in 1228, we see this, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So we see that 28th verse there, and we see here an exhortation, after all of this, Jesus is greater than stay with him. Jesus is greater than, stay with him. He finishes up the 12th chapter with, therefore, let us be grateful. And we can ask the question, what does grateful look like, right? What does grateful look like? What does thankfulness look like? And as we consider that and, and uh, ponder that into our minds, I think what we have then is that gratefulness looks an awful lot like obedience. And as I said last week, obedience is worship. Okay? I think you can make those almost ex as synonyms to one another. Obedience is worship. You might remember the words of Jesus in John chapter 15 where Jesus said this. He says, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Notice this part here. You are my friends if you do what I command you. And so Jesus has an expectation of obedience and the following of him. We showed the practical application of teaching in obedience. Obedience is gratefulness and thankfulness. It is worship of God. So if that is the case, as we jump into 13, what he'll look at is he'll look at some of, well, we'll call them hot button issues, and we'll see these, and he's calling for obedience in these difficult areas or areas which people have a hard time with. He's calling for obedience there, and that shows our thankful obedience and worship of him. So... Jump then into the 13th chapter. 13th chapter, we're only going to look at six verses this morning. So 13, 1 through 6. And we read this. First sentence, let brotherly love continue. A very simple, easily understood sentence. Let brotherly love continue. Let it remain. It's present tense. Let it continue and not, let, it, let it have its ways. Do not let it stop. Okay? The fun word here for brotherly love, the word brotherly love is the word Philadelphia, okay? You have often, you, we all know the word Philadelphia, right? Philadelphia is the city in Pennsylvania. Oftentimes people say, oh, it's the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, which now people say, no, it's the city of brotherly shove, right? <laughs> right, because there's, so there's so much violence there, so it's kind of an ironic name. But here we have it, and, we, and the... The church at Hebrews is told to be, be people who continually ongoing have brotherly love, take care of one another, appreciate one another. I always think the term brotherly love is a little interesting because I grew up with two older brothers and we didn't always have overly loving types of relationship, you know. I was usually teased or hit, you know, that was my life as, a, as the youngest of three brothers. 
Anybody here a younger brother? You know how it is, right? Yeah, you, you always got beat up, right? That's how it is. You know, and so brotherly love. Could we have something a little bit nicer love? No, it's a brotherly love. One thing I did learn about brotherly love, though, is that though my brothers could beat me up if they wanted to, they, nobody else could, right? Right, they would at least protect me on that. What we have here, again, I asked the question, what does brotherly love look like? We have examples, a negative example with Cain and Abel. The example of Cain and Abel is, is referenced in 1 John chapter 3. And in 1 John chapter 3, we have the example of Cain. And Cain goes and he takes his little brother, takes him out to the field, and kills his little brother. It's the very opposite of brotherly love. And it's interesting when we go to 1 John, or 1 John chapter 3, that there is a, there is a, uh, a contrast made. And really what John is trying to say, he says, don't be like Cain, who killed his brother, but be like Christ. And we come to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16, and I'm going to go ahead and read that for you because I don't want to misquote it, uh, and I think it's just so powerful. So in the context of Cain killing his brother, we have Jesus set up as the exact opposite. So in verse, I'll just read it for you, 3, 11, and 12. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning that you should love one another. We should not be like Cain who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. <clears throat> And then you skip down to verse 16, and we have the example of Christ. By this we know love that he, that is Jesus, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. And so, <coughs> pardon me. And so what we have here is we have this great contrast between Cain and Christ. So Cain is a selfish man, and Christ is a, there we go, self-sacrificer is what we have. So when we are looking for a good example or trying to figure out, well, what does brotherly love look like? It's not about hitting your little brother. It's about protecting him. It's about dying for your brother. It's about showing love for them. So again, the practical implications here. In verse 28, he says, be grateful. How do I be grateful? Love your brother. Love your brother. We go into verse 2, and it continues with this concept of love. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. You say, well, where is love there? Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Now, the word here for hospitality is philozeno. Philozeno, philo, like Philadelphia, there's that word love, okay? Philadelphia, Adelphius, think of that, that's the brother. And then the zeno, the zeno means stranger. The word hospitality means a lover of strangers, okay? Now, a lot of you say, well, I, I'm very hospitable, and you invite your friends over to your house, and you have dinner together, or you go out to the restaurant after, after church, and that's very nice, and I encourage that. Good job. Well done. But the actual word philo, uh, philozeno is the, the idea of being hospitable, that is, loving a stranger, and you have plenty of opportunity in the New Testament world of loving a stranger because you have itinerant preachers who have come from long distances, and you house them, and you feed them. Or you have people who are under distress, and you take care of them. You are a lover of a stranger, even if you do not know them well. So love the brothers, but also love the stranger. And it says here, this is kind of a, a funny little thing here. It says, some have entertained angels unawares. Any of you entertain an angel aware? <laughs> I'm just kind of curious. I'd like to talk to you. I think it'd be interesting, okay? And I look at this and I say, what, what, really? That's, that's pretty cool. Now, we do know that this does happen in Genesis chapter 18. And for time's sake, I'm not going to turn and, and look at it. But in Genesis chapter 18, we get the story of, of Abraham, for example. And Abraham, he's sitting there at his tent, you know, and all of a sudden he looks up and he's got three strangers right in front of him, Right? At least two of these strangers are identified a little bit later on as, as angels. The third one may be a theophany. We're not 100% certain. But what we have here is that Abraham sees it, and because he is supposed to be a lover of strangers, he immediately runs out and says, stay here, and I'll make dinner. Stay here just for a second. It can't be a second. You ever go and look at the, what they provide, what they do? They get like this whole bucket full of wheat and flour and make bread. Anybody here make bread? You're like, yeah, I do. In your bread machine right? Yeah. But you, it takes a long time to make bread. Not only that, they got to go out and they got to kill the fatted calf, right? Anybody? No, I'm not going to ask if you've killed a fatted calf lately, but you go out. I mean, that, that's going to take some time to barbecue and to make the bread. Good grief. If I have you over to my house and I go ahead and get a Costco frozen puck burger, all right? 
and pre-made buns, it's still going to take me 15 to 20 minutes, right? These people are making it from scratch. And here we have it, and, and, and Abraham's going to say, oh, stay right there. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going, to, I'm going to make it happen. And he does. He does. It's a different culture. I get that. But here it is. We are told to be a people who are ready to be hospitable, to take care of strangers. And it's hard for us because we, as Americans, have a hard time giving up our time. We, we do. Sometimes we would say, can I just write a check? I don't want to give my time. Hmm? But part of hospitality is being willing to give up your home, give up your comfort, give up your time. Love one another. Practical implications of all that we have read through that first 12 chapters. If you want to be grateful, what does grateful look like? Grateful looks like this, loving the brothers and loving the stranger. I think it's interesting. It goes further, though. He says, remember those in prison as though in prison with them. Wow. You are to love people prisoners. What? Now, keep in mind that Christianity is very much on the margins, and you're having people who are arrested, people who are, who are being thrown into chains. This is not a, a happy thing to be a Christian at this particular time. It's a challenge, to say the least. If you were to go to a prison today in America, you would find that it's relatively clean. Now, I haven't been into a prison prison, but I've been in jails. I've been in county jails, and if you go into the county jails, the people are clean, and they have a very nice matching outfits, right? Um, they get fed three times a day. They get cable television. They get a certain amount of time and they can do some recreation, okay? Uh, there's showers there. There are, okay? Um, it's, it's not that bad, okay? This is not the case in the Roman world. In the Roman world, you're put into jail for a couple of different reasons. You're put in there to die, you are put in there to wait for judgment, or you're being put in there to suffer a little bit. Essentially, you're there until you're whacked, okay, or sent off to, to judgment. This was not some sort of rehab center. This was not an opportunity to get your college degree. This was not about reform. This was about punishment. And here we have Christians, and they're set inside these jails. They're set in, and, and what our author is saying, he says, remember those who are in prison go, and go to them. Take care of them. Take them lunch, take them scripture, take them a jacket, take them whatever you can, help them out. As a matter of fact, Christians were so successful in doing this is that it sort of subverted the punitive effect of prisons. And so the emperor who uh, came about before Constantine, now mind you, that's at, way after this, but we see this. Uh, Licinius, this is from uh, Edwin Umachi, he writes this. He says, Licinius, the last emperor before Constantine, passed it passed a law and directed at Christians to the effect that no one was to show kindness to sufferers in prison by supplying them with food, that no one was to show mercy to those who were starving in prison. Isn't that interesting? The Romans were a bit upset towards the end of things because they said, you know what? This is not having the negative effect. We want to have it on prisoners. So Christians, stop being nice. Okay? Yet that's part of the mandate. Be nice. Okay? Show them, show them comfort. And so what we have here as part of this love is let brotherly love continue, let love for the stranger continue, take care of those in prison, and not only that, but take care of those who are, what does he say, mistreated. And those who are mistreated since you also are in the body. Take care of those who are having great difficulty. Now, we've already seen this a couple of different times. Hebrews chapter 10, and we see that uh, the people here have not resisted to the point of death, but they have resisted the, to the point of their property being confiscated. Okay? They had those type of issues. Okay? They have been mistreated. They have been made theater of. Okay? We live in a world now, folks, where more and more Christianity is more on the outlier. It, you know, People talk about protected classes of people. Christianity is not one of those. Okay? Christianity is oftentimes the object of prejudice. Um, the Guardian has this. The increasing persecution of Christians across the world should disturb us all. Uh, this is said by David Landrum, the head of advocacy of Open Doors in the UK and Ireland. Freedom of religion is what underpins many other human rights and civil liberties. Oppressive governments know this, and they are exploding the pandemic, meaning COVID, crisis, to turn the screws on Christians. It's true. 
any cri- anything that they can to, to go ahead and to make it more difficult for Christians. We have a governor right now who has said, well, you have to go ahead and follow my mandates now or you're not going to be able to serve in public office. Uh, I think many times this is done to go ahead and to exclude Christians. We continue in the 13th chapter. Remember those who are in prison as, those, uh, as though in prison with them, okay? Commiserate with them. And those who are mistreated since you are also in the body. I missed this the first couple times I read it, okay? Look at that section there at the very end of verse 3. Since you also are in the body. You know, sometimes as Americans, we talk about independence so much or as the independent spirit or we as individuals so much that we do forget that we are a people. Christians are a people. We are. And as a people, we are dependent upon one another. We support one another and others support us. There is a commonality, a commonality in Lord, a commonality in spirit. We worship the same God. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul writes of this. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, we read this. He says, if one member suffers, all, uh, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Again, we are not lone rangers, ladies and gentlemen. We are hooked together at the hip. When the Apostle Paul was uh, abusing the early church, when Jesus confronts the Apostle Paul and calls him eventually into ministry, Jesus speaks to, to, to Paul, and falling to the ground, he heard that as Saul f- heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? I mean, Paul wasn't persecuting Jesus. Jesus was, was, was in glory. And yet Jesus says, you're persecuting me because it's the body of Christ, the church. The church itself is being persecuted. Again, Jesus sees us as Individuals, yes, but he also sees us as a people. We are connected one to another. When I was in high school, senior year in high school, I was uh, taking an AP physics course, okay? Challenging course, hard course. Um, And I remember we had, uh, every once in a while, we would have labs, okay? And uh, we had a guy, an engineer from uh, Hewlett Packard, a guy from Hewlett Packard would come, and he was, always, he was a very interesting guy. Uh, he had always had very interesting labs. Uh, he wanted us to understand the Doppler effect, for example. Had one of the guys who played a trumpet, had him stand inside the engineer's Porsche through the sunroof, and he blew the trumpet as the Porsche went zip, zipping by us. Very, I can't, you'll never forget that. I always thought, you know, the engineer could have honked the horn, we would have had the same effect. But instead, we decided to risk the life of a student. Anyway. But, but we had all of these very interesting type of labs, and this guy would bring in different things. And I remember he brought in a hand crank, um, I don't know what you call it, a little motor of some sort. And it looked like, you know, an old-fashioned pencil sharpener, and you cranked on it, you know, and, you know. And it had two little nodes on it, and you grab a node, and if you grab the other one, it formed a circuit. Well we started playing a game. And so one person would grab, grab it, and another person would grab that other person's hand, and you'd form a chain all the way around the room. And then, crank, 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 crank. Fantastic. And everybody's fine. No problem. No issues whatsoever. Until finally somebody gets bored, and they let go. <laughs> and when you get that breaking of the circuit, all of a sudden the, person, the person's on the edge got zapped. We're connected. There is a, a vibrancy because we are connected together. We are not just individuals. We are also a people. And so this is what our author is telling us. He's saying, listen, I want you the brotherly love. I want it to continue. I want it to remain. I want it to be ongoing. I want it to be present tense. Not only that, I want you to be a, 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 a taker, carer, a lover of the stranger. You've got to do that as well. I want you to go out and the people who have been imprisoned, okay, because someday you might be a prisoner too, I want you to go out there and I want you to take care of them. Make sure they get their, you know, get a happy meal every once in a while, okay? For those people who are mistreated, they've had their things taken care of, perhaps you should go out there and you should make sure that they've got enough to eat or you should make sure that they're, you know, they have a, a roof over their head because you are part of one another. You are your one body. So we look at this and we look at this idea, what does it look like to be grateful? Part of being grateful is obedience and that obedience of love for one another. Great. That's an easy one. 
but let's meddle because, you know, come on, it's church, you know, I've got a pastor supposed to meddle a little bit, okay? So let's talk about sex, okay? That's a change of gears, right? Who oh, knows? Verse 4, let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. That's all he has in that section. That's a pretty big section. He tells you to love one another, that in obedience you are to love one another, but you're also supposed to have your sexual uh, appetites under control. Now, the church for a long time has had a hard time talking about sexuality within, uh, you know, congregational settings. And one of the reasons why is you get mixed audiences and you make people uncomfortable. You have mixed ages, and so you have to be kind of careful with that. You can't be overly obscene, for example. And I try not to be overly obscene. If I am, you can file your complaints on Tuesday. Okay? Uh, but I, I, don't, I don't think I will be, and, and I, I think I can, I, we can handle this. But you have to discuss this. Because, listen, we live in a world today which is highly sexualized, in a world which it's, it's all over the place. So you might as well speak about it, and you might as well have some tools to deal with this. Listen, let marriage be held in honor among all. Marriage is important. Marriage is something which God created. Now, our society is one which downplays marriage. Ah, marriage is not that important, you know. In every television show, you have people cohabiting before they're married. Okay? Anymore, you, you, you never see it where people date, they get engaged, and then finally they, be, they get married, and then, oh, fine, and then they have the honeymoon, and there's innocence and innocence brought together. You just don't see it. It's just, you just don't see it. People say, oh, well, marriage is just a legal contract, just a piece of paper. Oh. Came across this great little quote. Don't let people tell you that marriage is just a piece of paper. So is money, and I haven't seen a dollar bill in the trash yet. <laughs> marriage is not simp uh, uh, simply a piece of paper. It's an obligation. It's a choice of two individuals, a man and a woman, committing themselves one to another in front of a public group, okay? It's not something secret. It's a public spectacle for people to see. And sometimes they're small, sometimes they're huge, sometimes they're ridiculous, right? Okay. Well, you know, <laughs> no, you, you do have that. Okay. One of my great joys in life is that I'm married to my true companion in life. We live in a world <clears throat> which talks about, oh, well, marriage will stifle the person. Marriage enriches the couple. We are to be a people, we are to be a church where we honor marriage, we promote marriage. If you are to be married, of course, singleness, of course, of course, the Lord, of, that is perfectly fine too, because not every person marries, I understand that. But where we have marriage, we honor it, and we bless the Lord because of it. It is his idea, it is his gift. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, so we see here, again, within marriage, we have here sexuality within marriage. This speaks of marital fidelity. The husband longs, belongs to the wife, and the wife belongs to the husband. Therefore, we are to be a people. If you are married, you need to work upon intimacy. You need to work on enjoying one another. That's good. By the way, there is no fallback plan, so you might as well make the best of it, correct? Sure. Marriage is God's idea. Before the fall, God said, be fruitful and multiply. Marriage and sexuality are part of God's plan. It's pure, it's beautiful in the right context. It's the way it's supposed to be done. We are told, though, if we go ahead and take God's plan, crumple it up, and go ahead and do it our own way, there is judgment to it. Let marriage be held in honor among all. And let the marriage bed be undeveloped, for God will judge. I was just reading this uh, this week in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 5, we see the same type of concept. This is not just some sort of one-off passage. But in uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 3, But sexual immorality and impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talking or crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. 
For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, idol that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Our sex life is a way to express thanks to God because we're doing it within the boundaries which God has established. What is, thank what is thankfulness? What does gratefulness look like? It looks like loving the brothers. It looks like loving the strangers. It looks like taking care of those in prison. It looks like taking care of those who have been mistreated. It talks about in the most intimate situations within your sex life is that you take care of one another and you take care of your best friend in marriage. Enjoy one another. Some people will ask this, why is God so concerned about sex for crying out loud? Well, it's because it's his creation. He created it for good. And people say, well, it's not reasonable for teenagers, for example, to have things under control. Nonsense. Teenagers, that's exactly the time when you need to get it under control. Sexual desire is hard to get under control. It's difficult to get under control. If you don't get it under control in your younger years, it'll be harder in your later years. If you don't get it under control, you get rapists and you get abusers. You get cheaters you get men who are lost in pornography. You get women who are fearful of men. And you get the rest of all kinds of sexual craziness out there. You do. Get it under control because you'll need that control later on in life. I have a book in my office. I meant to bring it with me. I forgot to bring it with me. It's a, a, a book called The Game Plan by Joe Dallas. And it's a book on men's sexual integrity. It's a good book. It says, Men's Sexual Integrity in 30 Days. It's like, oh, Buy that up. The only difficulty with that is when you read the book, you realize, oh, it's a game plan, and it's 30 days, but there's a lot of work that has to go in it. It's going to take you a while, okay? Matter of fact, it's going to take you a life, okay? But that's the point. A life of gratefulness, a, gr a life of thankfulness is one which loves, but it also, and then when it comes to the most intimate relationships, it does it correctly, William Lane writes this in his commentary, sexual immorality is actually a rejection of the presence and goodness of God who created the human family in its maleness and femaleness. The writer warns that those who place personal gratification above the responsibility to God and to the community will encounter God himself as judge. I think he's right on. Love, sex, rock and roll, no. We're not going to there, okay. Say, this point three is rock and roll, really? No, it's not. It's worse. Money. Oh, God. <laughs> so we look at love, sex, and money. Say, Pastor, you're meddling. Yes, I am, because that's, okay. But this is a good meddling because these are hard things for us to get under control. We don't love as the way that we should. We don't have sexual control as the way that we should. And we don't use our money oftentimes the way that we should. If we did, there would be no instruction here. They'd just say, keep doing what you're doing. Right? Right? So much of the New Testament is written for, uh, to us and for us, it's because we have problems. Okay? So if you're sitting here, you've you're, you're, you got a lot of guilt, you know, in your, in your mind, you're in the same boat with a lot of people. Okay? This would not have been written if everything was easy. Okay? So it's written that we can get ourselves living a life of true thankfulness and gratefulness because that's what these things are. These are expressions of thankfulness. Look at verse 5. Keep yourself or keep your life free from the love of money. It's another love word. Philadelphia, love of the brother. Philozeno, love of the stranger. This one right here, love of money. Okay? And then you put the A in front of it, which says a not lover of money. Okay? So, Three times in a row, we get this word of love, love, love. Okay? It's all linked together. Okay? Keep your life free from the love of money. Hmm. Jesus talks about this quite a bit. No man can serve two masters. Either he'll love one and despise, right? I'm, I'm misquoting that. I need to write, get back here. I can quote it all day long and tell him in the pulpit. Okay? Matthew 6, verse 24, part of the Sermon on the Mount. 
No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. Russ Glessner, I remember us teaching on this one day, and he came up to me and he says, Stacy, nobody believes that. I said, what? That's a pretty harsh statement, Russ. He says, nobody believes it. He says, everybody wants to say, I'm the exception. I can serve both. I can serve God and money. I can do it. Nobody else can, but I can. Jesus says, nobody can. Nope. You are not the exception. The Apostle Paul will write in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, he says, the love of money is the root of evil, right? People who have a desire for love, they pierce themselves through with all kinds of desires from it. In my experience, I found that people don't do well with money. You oftentimes, it's hard to get the sweet spot, if you will, on levels of money. People who do not have enough money, they, they lack it, and so therefore it's a problem because they struggle with it. But I have found that people sometimes have too much money. Like, too much money? Yeah. I find that sometimes people get too much money, and they've got it, and then they become paranoid about losing it seen this many, many times. I've got it. I've earned it. I just don't want to lose it, and I'll do anything to avoid it. And they become selfish, and they become tight-fisted, and they become bitter. When I was studying German back in college, there was a book called uh, by, by Duermant. It was uh, uh, translated. It was called the, the Visit of the Old Woman. And the visit of the old woman as she comes into town, and people, uh, and, and she's very wealthy. And people are trying to figure out how in the world can they get her money. And she's very determined to make sure that they don't. And so you see both sides of greed. You see those who want something which is not theirs, and you yet see the other person tight-fisted and saying, you will not get it from me. Interesting book. We were missionaries in West Africa. One of the big problems which we had was money. Oftentimes it was not the lack of money, but it was too much money. There was an association of pastors in Benin. American churches were very excited to go ahead and give a gob of money to the churches in Benin so that they could build buildings. And that's what they did. I don't know what the amount was. Let's say $10,000. For us, pff, big deal. A church by itself got $10,000 and sent it there and it gave it to the Association of Churches in Benin, in a certain area of Benin. And they got it and they were able to build the building, but there was like $3,000 left over. What do you do with that? And so one pastor would accuse the other pastor of adultery. And the other one would accuse the other person of fraud. And the other person would accuse this person of this. And on and on and on it went. Because if they could go ahead and drive that person out of ministry, then they themselves could go ahead and either pocket it or have control of the money. Religious leaders, pastors, people in charge, people who are supposed to be godly, but because they don't know how to handle money, they had received too much of it, they became ensnared and stabbed themselves through. Finding themselves only to become a bad sermon illustration in America. What does gratefulness look like? Love, 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 love. Appropriate sexual appetites. The usage of money appropriately. You want to know what it looks like? Thankfulness? Here it is. Obeying what Christ wants. Con look, he, he continues to keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Be content. We are not good at content. We live in a marketed society. We, we watch the Super Bowl for the commercials. <laughs> Isn't that bizarre? Holy smokes. Could you imagine? Okay, First Baptist Church, maybe we should make this a, a project. We will buy a 15-second commercial on the Super Bowl. We're going to have to put in a lot of money. And we put in the money together, and we put the commercial out there on Super Bowl Sunday from your friends at First Baptist Church of University Place. 
be content. <laughs> right? <laughs> and blow people's minds. I got to tell you, actually, we we'll probably get a lot of people saying, who are, who are these people? Actually, that's, that might be brilliant. Hold on. Anyway. <laughs> but that's not what it's all about. All advertisement, is, all advertisement is designed to show you why you don't have enough and you need something else, right? It's there to sell you something. It is. Be content. Why can we be content? And be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm with you. I'm enough. Oh, Hebrew audience, you've had people come and they've stolen things from you and they've made theater out of you, but I'm with you. Christ is with them. In John chapter 14, Jesus will, say, will tell his, his disciples, I will not leave you orphans. I'll be with you. I won't leave you. the end of the book of Matthew, Jesus will say, Lo, I am with you always. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, and now we have here a, a, a mashing together of two, maybe three psalms. It's a little difficult for us. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? You know, I'm not sure. This could be Psalm 118, verse 6. It could be Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light, my salvation. For example, whom shall I fear? The last part of this is, what can man do to me? It's pro almost surely a quotation from Psalm 56, so I'll turn to that real quick. And in Psalm 56, verses 4 and 11, We read, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? Verse 11, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Listen, God's with me. I don't need to fear. Christ is with me. I do not need to fear. And he has this last little, little part here. What can man do to me? To which I write in my note in my Bible, I say, well, an awful lot. I mean, we already know that man, what can man do to, do to me? I mean, we already know from Hebrews chapter 10, they can steal your property and they can make theater of you. We already know that people can be persecuted. We already know that people can be uh, executed and, and martyred. And so I want to almost, almost yell at the passage and say, he can do a lot. But we have to understand this in short-term and long-term thinking. Yeah, in the short-term, they can do a lot to you. They can persecute you. They can cause you all kinds of grief. They can take your life from you, but ultimately they can't take your eternity from you. For Jesus is with you. Hmm. Ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, we are on the winning side because Jesus is with us. Listen, we get all kinds of nonsense going on in the news. Okay? I get a lot of Twitter pated and confused and frustrated Christians. And sometimes that's me too don't like the political atmosphere, don't like the moral atmosphere, don't like all kinds of stuff. But Christ is with us. Christ is with us. God is with us. Things might not be great in the short term, but Christ is with us. And because he is with us, uh, as the old song says, we can face tomorrow. What does gratefulness, what does thankfulness what does it look like? Love, 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 love. Appropriate sexuality, appropriate marital harmony, following God's sociological plan for, for mankind. And ultimately, it looks like being good stewards with the money which God has given to you. He's given you resources. It's not yours. It's not yours. Everything which you have is on loan. Stop worrying about things which are loaned to you. It's not that big of a deal. When all is said and done, it all gets burned up anyway. But Christ is with us. He is with us. And you will never lose him. And he will never leave you.
Amen? Amen. Amen.